Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the joint session between uh, World Heart uh, Federation and APSC on acute heart failure management. My name is Dr. Sisakun Jirakan Sinagon. I'm currently a medical director of heart failure and transplantation uh, in uh, Faculty of Medicine, Silirat Hospital in Bangkok, Thailand. Thank you so much for the APSC Scientific Committee for invi uh, inviting me uh, a chance to be a chair and speaker of this session. Uh, so if you have uh, any question, uh, you can uh, put it in the uh, QA box and we will answer the question at the end of the session. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be a first speaker uh, talking about fluid management uh, strategy in acute heart failure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sisakun Jirakan Chanakon. I am uh, the first speaker of this session uh, talking about a fluid management strategy in acute heart failure. I have nothing to discuss. Congestion is important because it's a main reason for admission for heart failure and complete decongestion is also important. Uh, congestion is defined as fluid accumulation in the intravascular and interstitial compartment, resulting from an increase in uh, cardiac feeling pressure. There are two main mechanisms uh, of congestion. The first one is uh, fluid accumulation caused by a uh, more adaptive uh, response of the kidney, uh, resulting in sodium and water retention. And the second one is fluid redistribution. In heart failure, there is a decrease in renal perfusion due to reduction of ineffective circulatory volume in combined with stimulating valvular receptor and neural hormone system. Uh, so the kidney uh, uh, will uh, uh, increase uh, the absorption of sodium and water. So this commissary mechanism uh, will increase uh, the effective circulatory volume that is good in short term. However, in long term, there is gradual accumulation uh, of fluid intravenous, uh, intravascular and interstitial compartment subsequently and making the size and symptom of heart failure. Fluid redistribution also uh, cause uh, congestion in heart failure. Uh, so spranic veins or the abdominal compartment of venous circulation is an endogenous fluid reservoir. It contains about uh, 20 to 50 percent of total blood volume. So in acute heart failure, sympathetic overactivations uh, will stimulate the alpha adenergic receptor, which is high dense in the spranic veins. So resulting in uh, acute shifting of the blood from the uh, strength compartment to the circulating compartment uh, and making uh, acute intravascular congestion, or we call it fresh pulmonary edema. And also uh, the long-standing venous congestion and chronic stimulation of neural hormone, uh, making the uh, venous capacitance function become more compromised. From the uh, data from the ESC has a really long term registry, uh, uh, the congestion is the main reason for heart failure hospitalization, accounting for 83%. Uh, and this thing is similar across the region, and most patients are wet and warm. Um, and less little congestion at discharge or incomplete decongestion is also very really important. The first thing is common. Uh, they found about 36% from the registry and residual congestion at discharge is associated with increase in one year mortality, heart transplantation and heart failure admission, especially when they combine with uh, uh, poor tissue perfusion. Uh, 
So you can see that complete decongestion is very important to improve the patient outcome and uh, loop diuretic play an important role uh, in heart failure management, especially uh, decongestion. So there are four main steps uh, for uh, loop diuretic action. The first thing is GI absorption. Uh, so in acute decompensated heart failure, there is low absorption related to gut edema. So that's why the guideline recommend to switch from oral to intravenous form of loop diuretics to overcome this problem. The second thing is delivery to the kidney. Uh, loop diuretic is highly protein bound. So in some situation like really low uh, serum uh, albumin or hypopropinemia, uh, this may affect uh, the diuretic response. And after that, the loop diuretic is actively secreted into the proximal tubular lumen mediated by OAT and MRP4 protein. So in some conditions like CKD or concomitant NSAID use, this may impair the secretion. And finally, it's by to the sodium potassium coli transporter at the ascending limb of Hillelu and inhibit sodium uh, reabsorption. One important thing is the dose less one curve change in heart failure. So in healthy person, you can see that there is a low natriuretic threshold and steep dose less one relationship and high ceiling. But in a person with acute decompensated heart failure, the curve shifts to the right and the natriuretic threshold increases significantly. So, and you can see that in the X axis uh, is log linear relation, is log of concent diuretic concentration. So all, all of this implies that uh, uh, in acute decompensated heart failure patient, they need much more higher uh, dose of loop diuretic to achieve the natural uresis. There are quite limited ev of evidence uh, of uh, using loop diuretic in heart failure. Uh, those HF uh, study is one of the landmark trials published 10 years ago. Uh, they uh, test uh, two strategies of uh, using loop diuretic in acutely compensated heart failure. The first one is comparing uh, between uh, intermittent bolus and uh, continuous infusion. And the second one is compiling between low dose and high dose strategy. So the, there is no uh, difference in primary endpoint patient global assessment at 20, uh, 72 hours. However, in the high dose group, there, is, uh, there was a favorable uh, effect on uh, uh, dyspnea relief uh, change in weight and uh, net weight loss at 72 hours. So even though uh, the, uh, the high dose group uh, had a higher uh, worsening, uh, higher rate of worsening you know, uh, uh, function, uh, uh, they, they have like a post hoc analysis and found that uh, at 60 days, uh, the difference is up here. Uh, so from this evidence, the guideline, uh, both from uh, European and American, uh, they recommend uh, starting dose of uh, 20 to 40 milligram of fulosima intravenously for fulosima if patients and uh, fulosima of uh, 1 to 2.5 times of uh, total uh, daily dose for patients with chronic loop diuretic use. And the next important step is early evaluation of the diuretic response. Conventionally, we use the amount of urine output uh, to evaluate uh, the natural uretic response. Uh, the guideline recommend uh, to uh, look at the urine output at six hours after the diuretic event and need uh, at least uh, 100, uh, 100 
to 150 uh, milliliters an hour. Uh, and however, uh, one emerging parameter uh, recommended in the uh, in the ESC guideline 2021 is our uh, Spot urine sodium, uh, the uh, good and uh, a good uh, natriuretic response uh, uh, is present when uh, spot urine sodium at one to two hours uh, uh, is uh, fifty to seventy uh, milliequivalent per liter or more. If the patient have good diuretic response. Uh, you, you can continue the similar dose uh, for every six to uh, 12 hours. Uh, but in patients with inadequate diuretic response, you, you need to escalate uh, the dose uh, by doubling it uh, every uh, like six hours um, until you uh, achieve the maximum uh, IV dose of fluoxetine. And, and now you are facing with diuretic resistance. So diuretic resistance is defined as uh, an inadequate, uh, inadequate quantity of natural uses despite an adequate diuretic regimen. Uh, there are several or many pathophysiology uh, causes of diuretic resistance and one patient may have one more than one uh, uh, etiology. Uh, the most uh, common uh, etiology is inadequate uh, lubricating dose. Um, because uh, in heart failure, there are uh, there is uh, an alteration of uh, pharmacokinetic and dynamics of lubricating. Uh, have mentioned earlier, uh, and also heart failure and uh, lubricating itself stimulate the, the uh, neural hormone system. So all of this uh, will make uh, the kidney uh, increase uh, sodium and water uh, reabsorption and. That's why you need a uh, much more higher uh, loop diuretic dose to overcome this. And in most patients, uh, by increasing diuretic dose, uh, you can overcome this problem. But in some patients, you, you can, and uh, because there are uh, some more uh, uh, underlying etiology of uh, diuretic resistance, like nephron remodeling and alteration of glomerular hemodynamic, that you need a specific uh, in the intervention to address these issues. So in chronic loop diuretic use patients, uh, there is a reduction in natural uretic response uh, to the same dose over time, so-called breaking phenomenon. Uh, there are two uh, uh, mechanisms to explain. The first one is nephron remodeling. In an animal model uh, with uh, chronic lubriotic use, uh, there is a hypertrophy of uh, distal horrotate tubule and collecting duct. And therefore that, um, the uh, reabsorption of sodium at distal tubule increased in patients with chronic loop diuretic exposure. And subsequently, uh, the urine sodium excretion gradually decreased. And, uh, and the second uh, explanation is application of NKCC2 in the loop of Hele. So to overcome the nephron remodeling or, or breaking phenomenon, uh, you need a uh, to combine the loop diuretic with the diuretic with different side of action we call a uh, sequential nephron rocket. You can use a uh, tire side, or uh, you can use a uh, uh, spironolactone or epirinone, or you can use acetazolamide. Uh, sometimes you may use a uh, web 10 with each adenine vasopressin 2 inhibitor. So the guideline, uh, recommend the combination of uh, diuretic therapy or sequential nephron rocket in patients who fails uh, escalation of group diuretics. The first line is a uh, thiazide or thiazide right diuretic uh, metorazone, uh, and you may add the third or the fourth uh, diuretic line thiazide or uh, spironolactone, and this is the recommended dose. 
One concern is about uh, electrolyte imbalance when you combine thiazide with low diuretic. For example, hypokalemia, hyponatremia, and uh, metabolic alkalosis. Uh, so the guideline recommends uh, to check uh, the serum creatinine and serum potassium, uh, serum electrolyte at least once a day. Another mechanism of uh, diuretic resistance is alteration of glomerular hemodynamic. Uh, in heart failure, uh, renal venous congestion is quite common, especially in patients with RV failure. Uh, in combined with uh, low cardiac output and increased in heart abdominal pressure, uh, this make a, a significant reduction in EGFR and worsening heart failure, so-called cardiorenal syndrome, and uh, subsequently uh, reduce uh, the diuretic response. So, in most patients, aggressive decongestion will help overcome uh, cardiorenal syndrome or uh, renal venous congestion. But in some patients, it may fail and you need some more special intervention like uh, inotrope, uh, 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 in invasive immunity guidance or uh, mechanical security support to reduce and improve the renal you know, hemodynamic. Or uh, in some patient who fails uh, everything, uh, you may need uh, autorification as a bailout option to remove the congestion. Uh, so the guideline uh, recommend if uh, yeah, there is no, no not improve or worsening in congestion, you may escalate the loop the unit. Uh, you may use auto decongestion strategy like atrophication or use hemodynamic monitoring in or through advanced heart failure therapy, uh, such as mechanical support. Finally, uh, if the patient is in uremic and uh, they are ready to, de to be discharged, uh, two things you need to do is one, switching the IV to uh, oral route and find the appropriate uh, lowest dose of loop periodic that can maintain uh, their will use status. And the second thing is uh, uh, you need to uh, optimize the GDMT because uh, optimization of GDMT can improve the uric response in long term. So before discharge, you need to uh, um, initiate or uh, optimize the GDMT. So in summary, Congestion is the main reason for admission for heart failure. And complete decongestion is one of the major targets of acute heart failure management. Understanding of renal physiology and diuretic pharmacokinetics is uh, essential for skillful use of diuretics in the management of heart failure. And, and diuretic resistance is not uncommon and is a major clinical challenge. Uh, step pharmacological care strategy. May, may help overcome and achieve the goal of complete decongestion. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, second speaker, Professor Janina Stepinska. Professor Stepinska uh, is a head of the Department of Intensive Cardiac Therapy at National Institute of Cardiology in Poland. Professor Stepinska was the past president of the Polish Cardiac Society uh, between the year uh, 2011 and 2013. She is an author and co-author of more than 200 peer review papers and also co-author and reviewers of several ESC guidelines, for example, uh, valvular heart disease guidelines and heart failure guidelines. Um, today, uh, Professor Stepinskar if is if giving us a talk about acute heart failure are the new 2071 ESC guidelines applicable at the global level. Uh, Professor, Professor Stepinskar, please. Good morning from Warsaw. Thank you very much for invitation, for being a part of this Congress. It's really a pleasure and honor for me to be with you. Uh, 
my topic today uh, is acute heart failure are the new 2021 ESC guidelines applicable at the global level. This is my potential conflict of interest. As you know, uh, every year ESC guidelines are at the end of August this year, the Congress was online. Uh, and the first guidelines presented during this Congress were uh, 2021 ESC guidelines for uh, acute and chronic um, heart failure. They are the third guidelines uh, during uh, the last, let's say, 10 years. Uh, and the reason for that, that is a lot of new ideas, new results of uh, randomized trials, but also the problem of acute heart failure and uh, chronic heart failure is growing up because an increasing number of patients with uh, heart failure. This is, of course, because of aging of the population all over the world but as well because of uh, very good treatment in cardiology, our success in, on one hand resulting uh, on the other hand with increasing patient, an increasing number of patients with um, heart failure. These new guidelines presented new concepts uh, for treatment in some groups and you can see here, and according to the acute heart failure, it's only the modified classification for acute heart failure. But of course, um, we uh, should look at the other things as well, because the problem of acute heart failure is not only to treat them in the moment of emergency, but also to plan long-term therapy according to the reason of heart failure and the result of uh, treatment. So guidelines shows as usual the way of diagnosis and treatment. Uh, for diagnosis as a first step, uh, electrocardiogram and echocardiography is indicated. Of course, in the same time, we should do some laboratory tests some of them are dedicated to all patients and they are quite simple and I think that um, possible to be done everywhere. Some of them, uh, of them on the right uh, side of the screen are a little bit more complicated, but the, mostly um, according to the um, to uh, other blood tests, but also um, computer tomography, as well um, uh, as uh, coronary angiography, but uh, these methods are very well known, and but not only, uh, not always, and not everywhere largely uh, used. Um, also, the um, natriuretic peptide testing is important part of diagnosis, especially to um, rule out acute heart failure as a reason of um, as a reason of emergency. Um, I can say that the discussion about the balance between the indication of natriuretic peptide levels and echocardiography is always. Uh, important uh, because um, in some countries uh, it's easier to do echo, in some it's easier to measure the level of um, natriuretic peptides, but all these uh, both these methods are very important uh, in the diagnostic procedure. So, um, as I told, the new classification of uh, heart failure was shown in these guidelines and, and the authors presented four scenarios of presentation of acute heart failure, which are acute decompensated heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, isolated right ventricular failure, and cardiogenic um, shock. Uh, the, this, um, modifications are um, including main cause, main symptoms, main mechanism of uh, acute heart failure, but also and also indicate the treatment uh, in um, each uh, situation. First uh, is uh, acute the, uh, the compensated uh, heart failure, which occurs in patients with a history 
of um, heart failure and previous cardiac dysfunction. Of course, the reason of this acute decompensation could be a little bit different, but usually the symptoms is not, are not growing during the hours, but during the days. And um, mainly um, they are associated with progressive fluid retention, which is, in, uh, which is responsible for uh, the situation. And as you can see in this flowchart, depending on hyperperfusion, the treatment uh, with uh, loop diuretics or uh, um, uh, in the same time with inotropes uh, is indicated. In the next steps, um, depending on the reaction of the treatment and uh, the therapy, we can optimize the therapy, but in some situation, renal replacement therapy uh, and sometimes mechanical circulatory support is indicated in uh, this uh, situation. Acute pulmonary edema um, is relating to, um, to related to lung uh, congestion, and the treatment depends of systolic blood pressure and signs of hyperperfusion. Then we can decide with uh, is uh, the treatment with loop diuretic sufficient, or we need to use inotropes, vasopressors, or both of them. Then if congestion relief, then we can, uh, we can stop on this medical treatment. But if not, uh, again, renal replacement therapy and mechanical circulatory support is re recommended for uh, these patients in some situation. We should consider, of course, the palliative care. And management of isolated right ventricle failure, which is not easy, and um, right failure is associated with increasing uh, with increased right ventricular pressure and right atrium pressure, and systemic congestion. Congestion, uh, right ventricular failure may also uh, impair left ventricular um, dysfunction and reduce cardiac output. And the fourth uh, scenarios of uh, of scenario of acute heart failure is cardiogenic shock. Um, this is uh, the presentation due to uh, primary cardiac dysfunction resulting in uh, inadequate cardiac output and, of course, tissue hyperperfusion and multi-organ dysfunction. And um, in this situation, of course, the, the reason of cardiogenic shock should be diagnosed, but uh, the use of mechanical circulatory support as a bridge to transplantation or in some countries as a, a destination therapy uh, is quite difficult element of uh, treatment in uh, this population of patients. So uh, in conclusion, we can uh, look at the, uh, uh, at the flow chart that we know very well from the previous guidelines for the initial management of um, acute uh, heart failure. And we can see here, the abbreviation that was in the last guideline is CHAMP, and right now is CHAMPIT, uh, or CHAMPIT, maybe uh, some people will say. Uh, this is because of adding of infection and tamponade um, to this abbreviation. And um, infection can be a cause of acute heart failure, especially during the era of uh, COVID pandemic, we should thought about uh, think about that as a reason of uh, acute um, heart failure in this population. Not only acute respiratory failure, but also heart failure is quite uh, common. So. Um,
the important information is also what should not be done in the population of acute heart failure. And you can see here class three recommendation, which means that in inotropic agents or um, should not be used um, to whole, all patients only in the situation of symptomatic hypotension, system, symptomatic hypotension or hypoperfusion. Routine use of opiates is also not recommended. Uh, and according to the shock trial results, intraortic balloon pump should not be routinely used in post MI um, cardiogenic shock. So um, this uh, in this scheme, you can see that uh, we have three steps of treatment of patients with acute heart failure. We talked about immediate and intermediate, but also very uh, important recommendation are about pre-discharge and long-term long -ter uh, term treatment. Uh, in uh, this uh, population, because we know that we should prevent um, next uh, acute decompensated or acute heart failure episodes, uh, as well as rehospitalization for heart failure, because um, that has an important um, uh, uh, element deciding about the future of this patient and the risk of death is quite much more high in the group with um, uh, the episodes of acute heart failure. So we, um, we should use also the other uh, indication for the guidelines for long-term term treatment. And I would like to tell you that there are a small correction in the terminology of um, heart failure, which was uh, might reduce when ejection fraction was between 14.1 and 49. Right now we call it might reduce the ejection fraction. And all for the patients with reduce ejection fraction, there is an indication to use four groups of drug as a class one indication. These are the drugs that reduce mortality. Uh, and uh, of course, this indication is quite difficult to be uh, followed in whole of the world. Uh, but for sure, we should remember that because as I told at the beginning, the information about uh, class one, um, class one in indication for treatment are very strong uh, according to the results of randomized um, trials. But, uh, so um, in conclusion, I would like to say that ESC 2021 guidelines for acute heart failure modify the classification of acute heart failure and uh, indicate the management of each of them, that education should be provided not only by ESC, but also by, by national societies. And um, the global, uh, in the, the global level, the goal should be able um, to, to apply. Of course, certain diagnostic tests, procedures, and also treatment will not be available everywhere. So heart failure treatment centers should be created all over the world according to these new guidelines. And then in the specialized uh, centers, maybe would be possible um, to follow the guidelines uh, all over the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Stepinska, for an excellent talk. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Christine Newby. Newby sorry. Uh, professor Newby is a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology and also serves as co-director of the Cardiac Care Unit at the Duke University Medical Center in USA. Professor Newby served as a reader of several randomized clinical trials 
um, of new therapies and treatment strategies for acute Curry syndromes with DCRI coordinating center. She also has been the principal investigators of multiple studies assessing the new uh, the use of novel protein biomarkers uh, to enhance list stratification and guide treatment selection in cardiovascular disease. Today, Professor Newby is giving us a talk about management of cardiogenic shock in 2021 guidelines, practice, and question. Professor Newby, please. Hello, my name is Kristen Newby, and I'm a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Duke University. I'm delighted to be participating in this joint symposium between the World Heart Federation and the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology to discuss acute heart failure management. My topic today is management of cardiogenic shock in 2021, guidelines, practice, and questions. These are my disclosures. As you all are aware, there are a variety of presentations of acute heart failure, and these can range from acutely decompensated heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, isolated right ventricular failure, and the most severe complication, cardiogenic shock, which comprises about 25 to 50% of the admissions to modern day cardiac intensive care units. And that's my topic to discuss today. So what is cardiogenic shock? Well, what I show here is the definition that's provided in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines on heart failure that were just published in 2021. It's a clinical syndrome due to primary cardiac dysfunction resulting in inadequate cardiac output comprising a life-threatening state of hypoperfusion, which can result in multi-organ failure and death. It can be acute, for example, occurring in the setting of acute myocardial infarction or progressive resulting from acute decompensation of chronic heart failure. There are a number of classic signs and symptoms of cardiogenic shock, including things like cool extremities, dizziness and confusion, tachycardia, narrow pulse pressure, and potentially hypotension, although hypotension is not a requirement for the definition of cardiogenic shock. There are also a number of laboratory abnormalities that are commonly seen, including elevated creatinine reflective of acute kidney injury, metabolic acidosis and elevated lactate, and evidence of shock liver, including elevations in the AST and ALT. There are five stages of cardiogenic shock, and these range from very early phases, stages A and B, which are either pre-shock or the very beginnings of uh, evidence of shock, like relative hypotension, to classic shock or stage three or stage C, which is uh, a presentation with hypoperfusion. More of the things that we're used to seeing where we're decongesting patients, we're starting to think about inotropes and potentially mechanical circulatory support. And what we're trying to prevent is progression to stages D and E, or a deteriorating state or extremis, which is very hard to recover a patient from. Cardiogenic shock is a highly morbid um, condition. As you see here in data from the Cardiovascular Critical Care Trials Network Registry in North America, which comprises 16 uh, cardiac intensive care units and 585 patients, Mortality both in the cardiac intensive care unit and in the hospital is quite high, ranging from about a third up to 40%, depending on uh, the location, CICU or in hospital, and the etiology of the cardiogenic shock, whether it's acute myocardial infarction or cardiogenic shock without MI or a mixed picture of cardiogenic shock with some vasodilatory components. But overall, mortality is abysmal once the patient reaches cardiogenic shock. And everything that we're trying to do is to prevent that deterioration and recover um, those patients. The recent 2021 ESC guidelines on heart failure provide a nice algorithm for the management of cardiogenic shock. 
primarily um, the, the main initial step is to determine whether the shock is due to an acute coronary syndrome, acute myocardial infarction, or mechanical complications thereof, which will dictate the use of some advanced um, therapies. But overall, once that decision is made, the fundamental underpinnings of oxygen therapy, decongesting the patient with diuretics are similar regardless of the etiology of shock. And I think the most striking thing that you'll notice here in this color-coded algorithm is that the things that are class one recommendations shown in green are very few in the context of managing cardiogenic shock. The vast majority of the recommendations are class two, either 2A or 2B, and there's very little evidence um, supporting them. So they're mostly class C or expert opinion recommendations. And we'll talk about these in a bit more detail in the coming slides. So what are the recommendations with regard to inotropes and vasopressors? So again, very few recommendations and, and reflecting the overall lack um, of evidence. So for inotropic agents, a class 2B recommendation, they may be considered in patients with systolic blood pressure less than 90 and evidence of hypoperfusion who do not respond to standard treatment, including things like fluid challenges to improve blood pressure and maintain organ perfusion. Inotropic agents are not recommended. So a class three recommendation due to safety concerns, primarily arrhythmias, unless the patient has hypotension and evidence of hypoperfusion at the time they're being considered. Now, both of these are level of evidence C, expert opinion um, recommendations. Again, reflecting just the overall absence of randomized clinical trial data or even large observational study data in this space. Similarly, for vasopressors, a class 2B recommendation uh, for uh, use uh, to support blood pressure and increase vital organ perfusion. But again, limited um, evidence and uh, the only real evidence is a comparison among inotropes that norepi or norepinephrine may be better than other um, inotropes in patients with cardiogenic um, shock. And again, uh, very little evidence, level of evidence B recommendation. So with that in mind, what do we know about how vasopressors and inotropes are being used in clinical practice? And these are data from the CCCTN registry, the Cardiovascular Critical Care Trials Network registry in North America, reflecting 16 sites in Canada and the United States. And, and I show these data because the guidelines, although I'm showing the more recent ESC guidelines, the guidelines um, from the AHA and the ACC are very similar to the recommendations in the ESC guidelines. And what you see here in terms of use of vasopressors and inotropes is that despite only class 2A, 2B recommendations, whether it's acute myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock shown on the left, or cardiogenic shock without myocardial infarction shown on the right, over 90% of patients are treated with vasopressors and inotropes in these North American critical care um, units and anywhere from one to two um, inotropes depending on um, the type of shock. So clearly not well aligned with the, the limited evidence uh, and the uh, somewhat weak 2B, 2A recommendations in the guidelines. What do the guidelines um, say about temporary mechanical circulatory support, things like balloon pumps um, and impellas? Well, again, mostly class two recommendations with level of evidence C, meaning again, expert opinion and reflecting the lack of data, lack of randomized clinical trials and outcomes um, uh, studies, observational studies in this space. So short-term mechanical circulatory support should be considered in patients with cardiogenic shock as a bridge either to recovery, to um, destination, or another bridge, um, a definitive treatment, or another uh, bridge 
Uh, but again, team-based um, decision-making that has to consider um, the cause of the shock and the long-term um, options for that patient. Similarly, um, balloon pumps um, can be um, considered, but an even weaker um, recommendation. And you see in red, a class three recommendation for intraaortic balloon pumps in cardiogenic shock caused by acute myocardial infarction. And this is based on a single randomized clinical trial that showed no benefit of intraaortic balloon pumps in acute MI cardiogenic shock compared with optimal medical therapy. So let's look at the registry data again and consider how these mechanical circulatory support devices are being used in clinical practice. And these are the same data, uh, same population from the CCCTN uh, registry in North America, 15 sites, 585 uh, patients. And what you see is there's wide variability in the use of mechanical circulatory support, ranging from about 20% to about 50% um, across these 15 sites. And you see the mix in blue of intraaortic balloon pump and in red, other mechanical circulatory support devices such as Impella. And by and large, the vast majority of that is um, balloon pump use um, in North America. Now, this may vary in other areas of the world, depending on um, local practice and experience um, with the devices. But again, a very wide um, variability and potentially reflecting these class two recommendations where there's only um, expert consensus and a, and a lack of clear um, direction on how we should be managing these patients. So what's perhaps more important is that the use of temporary mechanical circulatory support does not seem to vary by shock severity. So what you see in these two graphics is tertiles of use of mechanical circulatory support, ranging from low on the left to high um, use on the right. And you see that the distribution of risk, low risk shown in purple, uh, moderate risk shown in orange, and high risk shown in green um, does not vary by uh, the tertile of use. So high use sites are using it mostly in low risk patients. Similarly, low use sites are using it mostly in low risk patients. So no association between use and severity of the shock at presentation. Again, reflecting an opportunity to better understand both practice and to provide evidence to guide the use of these therapies in practice. And finally, we have one solid recommendation, class three level of evidence B for not using intraaortic balloon pumps in patients with cardiogenic shock associated with acute myocardial infarction. And if you'll focus on the left-hand column in this slide, you see that among patients with acute MI associated cardiogenic shock who receive mechanical circulatory support, despite that class three recommendation, over, two thir over uh, three quarters of that, 76% is uh, intraortic balloon pump use. So clearly a, um, uh, a dyssynchrony between the guidelines and what we see in practice. So what are the gaps and opportunities in management of cardiogenic shock? Well, I think the first thing that I've tried to emphasize throughout is that most of these recommendations are class two recommendations and they are by and large level of evidence here, expert consensus recommendations. And when we see that, it tells us there are opportunities for randomized clinical trials. More research is needed. And a couple of examples um, are, do we need inotropes to manage the classic cardiogenic shock patient? There are no studies that have head-to-head -head compared inotropes with no inotropes. And we have to, I think, consider when we should use those as well. Uh, you know, is there an opportunity to better understand their utility, for example, in stages A and B to prevent progression or stage um, C 
So I think the question inotropes versus no inotropes is ripe for further exploration. It, it has to be done stratifying by the stage of cardiogenic shock. The same question could be asked about temporary me mechanical circulatory support versus not using mechanical circulatory um, support. Do we really need it? And if we really need it, in what stage of cardiogenic shock is it most beneficial? So great opportunities to clarify the guidelines, to help guide uh, practice, and hopefully to improve the abysmal outcomes of patients once they are uh, in the state of cardiogenic shock. I think there are also great opportunities to understand drivers of clinical practice. So why is it when we see mechanical circulatory support as a class 2B recommendation in cardiogenic shock, is it used in up to 50% um, of patients with cardiogenic shock and with wide variability by site and no association with the severity of illness or the severity of cardiogenic shock? So again, another tremendous um, opportunity to understand practice and potentially improve the outcomes of our patients. And then finally, um, another example here is intraaortic balloon pumps. We have randomized clinical trial um, data that suggests there's no benefit compared with optimal medical therapy in patients with uh, acute myocardial infarction associated cardiogenic shock. And yet it's used in 75% of patients who are treated with mechanical circulatory support in the setting of AMI cardiogenic shock. So just another um, opportunity for education and for understanding the drivers of clinical practice. So I'm going to conclude uh, my talk here. Um, I, I think um, this is a, a very important um, aspect of heart failure um, to understand in part because of its high mortality and certainly many opportunities to uh, better understand care and to uh, provide better care and hopefully improve mortality for our patients. I'm going to leave you with a bibliography of recent um, physician statements, scientific statements, and guidelines um, in this area for um, further review as I've, I've done a very high level um, overview of cardiogenic shock. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Newby, uh, for the, your fantastic talk. Uh, so uh, now we are moving to uh, the QA session. Uh -huh. So I'm going to ask uh, Professor, uh, we have no uh, any question in the chat box yet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask uh, uh, Professor Stepinski, Stepinska first. Uh, so uh, for the ASC guideline 2021, uh, um, the vasodilator was uh, drugged from class one recommendation to 2A recommendation. Um, uh, do you have any uh, advice uh, what kind of patient uh, with acute heart failure should be used uh, vasodilator first? Uh, that like, uh, Patient need to have like hypertension or not, or just uh, what what is your suggestion? The um, highest contraindication for vasodilators is low blood pressure. So um, then we should be very careful. But on the other hand, we know that the vasodilators decrease the preload. So it's uh, uh, very helpful in the treatment of some patients with acute heart failure. As usual, we have a balance between the, um, uh, the the expectation of uh, helpful treatment with vasodilators. And on the other hand, we are afraid about hypertension because we know that the, uh, expect that, uh, the potential improve of the patient with acute heart failure is much higher in the group of higher blood pressure. We have some studies that show that very well that low blood pressure um, is uh, in the population with low blood pressure, uh, the mortality is much higher than mm -hmm. the other one. So uh, 
as we heard before a moment before it's very uh, that inotropes we have not very hard data that inotropes could be very helpful in this uh, acute heart failure population so as usually it is a balance usually we are using some uh, on, in the population or with high blood pressure or normal blood pressure we can use vasodilators you know, in all the situations that uh, patients have indication to that, but we should be very careful with blood pressure in this population. Um, we can expect uh, the increased number of kidney failure when we have low blood pressure and all these uh, consequences of uh, uh, low blood pressure. So, of course, we are using vasodilators. We have one A recommendation because of the studies that shown us very well that it help. It is very helpful in contractility, in cardiac output, and it is very helpful in in, in acute heart failure. But on the other hand, we should be very careful and um, uh, uh, monitor blood pressure. Uh, invasively. Thank you. Um, so now I'm asking uh, Professor Newby about uh, vasopressor and uh, inotrope uh, use in cardiogenic shock. Uh, as you said, we have like really limited uh, evidence in this field. And uh, we have like subgroup analysis from the SOP2 trial published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, show that uh, uh, norepinephrine uh, may be uh, favorable, favorable uh, uh, than uh, dopamine in uh, cardiogenic shock, right? And some of my colleagues uh, use norepinephrine as a first line up for uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, do you agree with that uh, uh, statement or uh, what, uh, what, what your uh, practical uh, in, in, in the ordinary practice about selecting uh, inotrope or vasopressor first in patients with cardiogenic shock? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great question. And, and uh, as I tried to highlight, I think it's one that we don't have a, a definitive answer to. And I think like your colleagues, um, you know, my colleagues, uh, myself, uh, we reach for inotropes and vasopressors routinely, as I, I showed in some of the practice data from North America. And uh, I, I think the, you know, the surprising thing is that we, you know, clearly, um, you know, we, uh, we, we don't have strong guidance in the guidelines. We don't have a lot of data. Um, and we're doing what intuitively we think is the right thing. And I, I think this is a, a you know, when we have that situation, it's a, it's just a terrific opportunity to answer the question. And um, the Canadians uh, um, from the Ottawa group recently published a study looking at uh, milrinone versus dobutamine, for example. Um, you know, for those of us who do reach for um, an, an inodilator, um, should we reach for one over the other? And it showed there was absolutely no difference. Um, yeah. And you know what they're talking about doing now is actually a randomized clinical trial of any uh, inotrope versus uh, optimal medical uh, therapy. So I think you know those are the kind of creative things that we all need to be thinking about doing to get the answers to guide practice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I agree. We need more data about that. Yeah. Um, so now there is a question for uh, Professor Stepinska about uh, using Fantastic for uh, at the discharge of a patient with acute heart failure. So what, what is your recommendation for selecting among the class one recommendation for last inhibitor, uh, AS or ARNI, MRA, uh, beta broker, or SGLT2 inhibitor? If resources are limited, or uh, uh, clinically, uh, clinically patient cannot tolerate all of them. I didn't hear you very well, uh, oh. your question. The question is about the, the treatment with these four indicated medication in acute heart failure, right? Yeah, when, when patient discharge, uh, ready for the, to discharge, uh, uh, yeah. Well, how, how do, how do you select, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I think that it is a very important thing because for the first time, European guidelines indicate us to use four med medication, all four of them, um, and we should, uh, 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 we can add one by another, but during, let's say, four weeks, we should treat it patients with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, um, with all of them. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, in many countries, it would be really very, very difficult to uh, follow these guidelines. As we discussed here in acute heart failure, we have very low evidence uh, for some um, treatments. And on the opposite, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as I told, uh, this is uh, more than 92% of indication are according to the randomized, large randomized trials which we can say that there are very strong indications. So, um, the, the, and um, I think that it is a little bit difficult for us. I don't know how, it, how it's in your country, but for example, in Poland, it would be really difficult to follow that because uh, this is really not possible to, for patients um, to, to buy all this medication. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, so um, we have to choose. And importantly, these guidelines show us that diuretics are the, the last choice. No, they are important in acute heart failure, but for long-term treatment, not for all patients, according to the SGLT2 uh, diuretic effects. So we don't have to use them. That was a cheap therapy, a uh, mm -hmm. uh, contrary for, for um, the other one. So for sure, we should treat patients with ACE inhibitors, which are, I think, it is largely possible, uh, and uh, or ARNI. Uh, let's look that ARNI is indicated still as a class one indication after uh, ACE inhibitor treatment, but uh, in some situation you can start, even we have small trials that show us that you can start treatment with ARNI even in acute heart failure. So beta blockers for sure, mineralocorticoids for sure, and if it's possible, all four should be, should be indicated for the patients before discharge from the hospital. And mm -hmm. also we should plan the first visit after this acute state. Uh, and you know, some medication can be, can be um, prescribed during this first visit, not all together, but um, we should use all of them according to the guidelines. Thank you very much. Uh, so there is a question about uh, IABP use in cardiogenic shock. Uh, the question is why IABP does not show some benefit in cardiogenic shock associated with AQMI? What is the explanation and which patients we prefer to use IABP? Yeah. It's quite tough. Yeah, so I, uh, that is a uh, that's a tremendous uh, uh, you know question in acute myocardial infarction, and I, I don't know that we'll learn that from um, from the shock trial um, in which from which those data um, came. I, I think it's probably complex, and that includes that you know optimal medical therapy in acute myocardial infarction is pretty powerful, right? It, it's the same medications basically that we were talking about, ACE. Um, particularly uh, ACE inhibition uh, for afterload reduction and remodeling and, um, you know, decongesting therapy um, acutely. And um, so there's that component that medical therapy is pretty good. Um, and I think the other piece is that there are complications of um, balloon, uh, balloon pumps and particularly bleeding that we know is also um, associated with worse outcomes in acute myocardial infarction. So I think it's probably kind of a complex interplay between the effectiveness of medical therapy and our acute management of heart failure. 
and the risks, mostly bleeding, um, of yeah. a balloon pump. And I, I think those that balance is a little bit different when you have acute decompensated heart failure leading to um, cardiogenic shock. And we also have more discussions there about bridging to either transplant or to um, LVAD or, or something else. So I think the, the game is a little bit different in acute MI uh, and the risks and benefits are a little bit different in those two, um, two settings. Okay. So the next question is uh, quite similar to the last question, but uh, asking about, do you think does IABP provide more benefit in acutely compensated heart failure with cardiogenic shock? than uh, AQMI with cardiogenic shock. Just yeah, and that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. I think in acute decompensated <laughs> heart failure that leads to cardiogenic shock, we may be thinking about using it in a little bit different way, and that's more in a, in a bridging way. Although, you know, I will highlight again, these are all class 2A, 2B recommendations. Yeah. There's just not a lot of evidence that even in that situation, we're uh, having an effect on you know, meaningful clinical outcomes. Um, so I, I do think we need more evidence, but I think the clinical situation is definitely different than in acute myocardial infarction. And I hope we can get more evidence. The, the other thing I would say in the United States, there's a little bit of a perverse um, incentive to put um, balloon pumps in or to use vasopressors and inotropes, um, particularly for patients being considered for transplant um, to uh, optimize their ranking on the on the transplant list, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you know, and their likelihood of getting an organ. So, I, you know, there's it's complex <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so, my, my last question, uh, my question for Professor uh, Stepinska about a uh, PA catheter using in acute heart failure. Uh, because uh, the, the evidence we have like uh, from the escape study, it doesn't show a uh, benefit in uh, uh, patient, uh, using routine use of uh, PA catheter in acute heart failure, right? Uh, in your clinical practice in, in, in Europe and in the US, uh, what kind of patient or what kind of uh, situation do you use uh, PA catheter? Uh, can you can you suggest? You know, uh, I, I I agree with the result of the study, so we follow that. Uh, yeah. I can say that. Uh, but if I can comment a little bit to the last question, if it's possible, because yeah. it's interesting using intraortic balloon pump in acute decompensated heart failure. I mm -hmm. can say you what is our practice, for example, in Poland. We are beginning with uh, intraortic balloon pump because it's not always possible to put patient, for example, on ECMO or on LVAT uh, immediately. Mm -hmm. And in some situation, if we are not doing that too late, because I think I don't know if person maybe agree with, with me, uh, it is important to begin this therapy not too late. If you are putting the patient on intraortic balloon pump, you can really have a, quite a good results in this acute phase. And also you can prolong this uh, intraortic balloon pump for longer time. It's easier than, for example, prolonged ECMO, uh, which is usually, uh, you know, um, the, 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 uh, the window that you have to, to change from um, ECMO to Elvert, for example, is quite short comparing with intraortic balloon pump. So I think that we still have some population that uh, where, where we can use it. Do you agree with me, Professor Newby? I, I completely agree. I mean, we rarely use um, ECMO. I, uh, the, the folks that uh, for us end up on ECMO are people who fail um, balloon pumps or um, impellas and and aren't quite ready to go to that and it's it's really that last uh, that last bridge we use it some in uh, cardiac arrest uh, you know as a bridge to recovery there but um, yeah I agree I think in uh, acute decompensated heart failure cardiogenic shock um, from deterioration of chronic heart failure um, you know I think there are more uh, uses of balloon pump, again, as a stabilization 
um, and as a bridge to transplant to LVAD um, mm -hmm. that, that aren't as applicable in acute myocardial infarction, um, for example. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it sounds like our uses of the device are pretty similar um, between um, Poland and what we do um, in the United States, at least in that, um, in that group of cardiogenic shock um, patients. Thank you. Uh, this time is running so far, so uh, I think we, we need to close the session. Uh, I am enjoy, uh, very much enjoy very much uh, for your excellent talk today, Dr. Uh, Newby and Dr. Uh, Stepinska. Thank you very much. And uh, I, we need to say goodbye. Uh, thank you very much for every audience. Bye. Thank you for invitation. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. It was a pleasure.